Anyway, I'm glad you guys are here. Come with me to the psalm. Psalm 22 is where we're starting today. I love to get to open the service for the psalm. This one, I feel, is absolutely perfect following up Easter Sunday. As I spoke about last weekend, this is what Jesus quotes on the cross in one of his prayers. Um, and so this is an amazing psalm that I think you're going to see Jesus all over, and it'll become important later for our message today. We're in Psalm 22, verse 1. It says this, My God, my God, why have you abandoned me or forsaken me? Remember this from last weekend, right? Cries on the cross, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer. By night, yet I have no rest. But you are holy and thrown on the praises of Israel. Our ancestors trusted in you. They trusted and you rescued them. They cried to you and were set free. They trusted in you and were not disgraced. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by people. Everyone who sees me mocks me. They sneer and shake their head. He relies on the Lord. Let him save him. Let the Lord rescue him since he takes pleasure in him. It was you who brought me out of the womb. Make me secure at my mother's breast. I was given over to you at birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. Don't be far from me because distress is here and there's no one to help. Many bulls surround me. Strong ones of Bashan encircle me. They open their mouths against me. Lions mauling and roaring. I am poured out like water and all my bones are disjointed. My heart is like wax melting within me. My strength is dried up like baked clay. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. You put me into the dust of death. For dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. Hear Jesus, right? They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count on my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among themselves and they cast lots for my clothing. But you, Lord, don't be far away. My strength come quickly to help me. Rescue my life from the sword, my only life from the power of these dogs. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, as we approach a difficult passage this morning, God, help us hear these words that you cried out on the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Let us recognize that in that dark moment on the cross, you felt what we so often feel, that we've prayed but we weren't heard. God, that we've asked, but we were denied. God, that we we know we're your children, but sometimes we pray and we feel a distance between us. Help remind us that Jesus felt that same distance on the cross, but he cried out, Lord, into your hands I entrust my spirit. Help us to have a heart. And in all the trials, we say, Lord, I trust you. Into your hands I entrust my spirit. I entrust my, my life. God, you're an awesome God. Give us clarity. Give us a heart to see today. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. So we are continuing our series on kingdom that we left off in um, for Easter because we had a special service for Easter. So go ahead and join me. We're going to Matthew chapter 15, and we are going to verse 21, which is where we're going to start today. Just to remind you where we've been. We've been following Jesus as he teaches us that he is the king of a better kingdom. And so often we as human beings have this tendency to set up our own kingdom, our own way, our own rules, our own uh, uh, desires, the things we want to do, the things we want to believe. And a lot of the times that ends up becoming opposed to the kingdom of God. We saw that where we left off, if you remember the Pharisees, they had their religious kingdom and and they had heard of this Jesus guy. And so they come down from Jerusalem to try to find something wrong with him. And what do they find? He doesn't wash his hands before he eats, which, I mean, that's not a, that's not a a, a huge crime, but he doesn't wash his hands before he eats. And that that was, the issue was that wasn't in line with the tradition of the elders. Remember that? It wasn't about the law of God. It wasn't about the good thing God's asked, but They said, well, you're not doing what our tradition says you should do. And so we saw all that happen last week. The religious kingdom of the Pharisees was opposed to the kingdom of God. This week, we're going to read something that is extremely challenging, that on the initial glance is going to be very hard to read, but something that I think by the end of this sermon today, you will feel is actually an amazing passage that I hope you're going to fall in love with by the end of our time together. All right? 
I, I think this is going to be one of those passages you go back to and you say, wow, that's an amazing, amazing example of the love of Jesus. So let's get into it. Matthew chapter 15, we're in verse 21. It starts this way. When Jesus left there, remember left the Jewish people, left the Pharisees in that debate. When he left there, he withdrew to the area of Tyre and Sidon. Just then, a Canaanite woman from that region came and wept, crying out, Have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. So here's the context of what's happening here. Jesus leaves the Jewish cities in this region, and he heads to Gentile cities. That's why they mention Tyre and Sidon. These are, these are cities of the nations, non-Jewish cities. And when he goes there, this woman comes to him, and she is a Canaanite woman. Now, for those of you who have, have read through your Bible and you know the stories of the Old Testament, Canaanite should immediately ring some bells in your head, okay? But if it doesn't, let me explain. You see, when, when the Israelite people were in captivity in Egypt, God frees them, and he brings them into relationship with him, and he lets them know, hey, I promised your ancestor Abraham that I was going to give you a land. And so that's where I'm taking you. I'm taking you to the promised land. Well, when they get there, there's this group of people that inhabit that land, and they are called the Canaanites. The Canaanites. And the Canaanite people are a particularly wicked group of people. They are so wicked, in fact, that they sacrifice their own children in a fire-based sacrifice, burning them alive, to the god Baal. And this so disgusts God, this evil is so heinous to God that he sends the Israelite people to bring judgment to this nation of Canaan. And he commands them, you're to go into this land, you're to conquer this people, and then you're going to inhabit the promised land. God commands them in this story to wipe out all of the Canaanite people, to leave no one left. And I'm not going to address that story. If you have questions about it, please come talk to me. But that's not where we're going today. The point is, God makes this command. The Israelite people disobey God's command. They let the Canaanite people live. They don't obey what God has asked of them, and it causes their nation to fall and to crumble. In essence, they become corrupt, and they begin worshiping the gods of the Canaanites. They start to intermarry and have kids and pick up their traditions, because that's what God was warning them of in the first place. This is why you need to get rid of these people. They're going to cause you to stumble. You may not have known that story until I just told you, but every Jewish boy and girl in Jesus' day knew that story by heart. They knew that story by heart. You want to know why? Because it was a perfect example of what happens when you don't follow through all the way with what God commands you to do. And the Jewish people knew the Canaanite people we were supposed to get rid of caused us to fall as a nation and eventually will cause the Israelites to be expelled from the promised land. This woman is from that group of people. She is a Canaanite woman. Of all people in the world that the disciples who follow Jesus would look at and say, that person cannot come into the kingdom of God, it's this woman. Why? We can't make that mistake again, right? If we let a Canaanite in the kingdom, we've already seen how that plays out. We already see how that plays out. Israel falls, Israel falls apart. This woman is the perfect example of somebody that the Israelite nation as a whole and Jesus' disciples would never accept as part of the kingdom. It's very important for this story. She comes to Jesus and she's crying out, she's weeping. And she says, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. She acknowledges him as the Messiah. Son of David is a messianic title. My daughter is severely tormented by a demon. I want you to realize the amount of faith that takes. I guarantee you, a Canaanite woman so close to Israelite Jewish cities had regularly experienced harassment or abuse or rejection or violence at the hand of Jewish men and women in their community. There's just no doubt about it. It's just something she would have experienced. And here she is coming to a fully Jewish man, Jesus, the Jewish Messiah, who's coming through this land, and she's coming to him and calling him the Messiah and asking him to heal her daughter. This is an amazing act of faith. Amazing. And this is where the story begins to become interesting. All right, so bear with me all the way through. Don't lose me on this. Verse 23, 
Jesus did not say a word to her. She's crying, she's weeping, begging Jesus heal. He ignores her. He ignores her, okay? He didn't say a word to her. His disciples approached him and urged him, send her away because she's crying out after us. There's two possibilities here, right? They're either embarrassed, we're following Jesus, and there's this Canaanite woman who's following us everywhere we go. She's weeping, she's crying, she's begging for her daughter to be healed. Jesus is ignoring her. They're either embarrassed, get rid of this woman so we can stop having her crying behind us and making us look bad, or they genuinely feel bad. Either way, they don't have the right response, right? She's still a Canaanite, so it's not Jesus heal her daughter, it's Jesus what? <laughs> Send her away, right? Kick her out. But nonetheless, whatever the situation is, they feel bad. Jesus, what are you doing? Why are you ignoring her? At least get rid of her so she can stop following us crying. Hold on, all right? Don't give up on me. Stay with me. He replied, verse 24, I was sent only to the sheep of the house of Israel. He doubles down. He doubles down, right? They come and say, hey, this woman's crying behind us. Get rid of her. You're ignoring her. You got to do something. And he says, what? I only came for the Israelites. Okay? Stay with me. Verse 25, but she came and knelt before him and said, Lord, help me. Now, this is really important. She knelt before him. This is the same exact word. Remember our story when, when Peter walks on the water, right? And then they return to the boat. What do the disciples do? They throw themselves at Jesus' feet in worship, right? You remember that story? Same word. She throws herself at Jesus' feet in worship and says, Lord, help me, right? Keep coming with me. He answered, it isn't right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. He doesn't just double down. He triples down. He triples down right? Now, I don't want to lose sight of this. I hear many people say, well, this doesn't mean what you think it is. Maybe it's a translation thing and a cultural thing, and being a dog is a good thing. No, it's not. No, it's not. Uh, my wife gets the pleasure of hearing me uh, uh, preach my sermon to her before I ever preach it to you guys, and now I'm not sure that's a pleasure because it's five, six, seven, eight times of a mess of a sermon before it actually comes to you guys. But but when we talked about this last night, that was her thing. Why the dog thing? Why call her a dog? What is going, did he have to say it that way? And, and I think that's absolutely true. So, you know, I tried something last night and, and, you know, I wouldn't recommend it, but I was, you know, I was like, maybe it's a good idea. I'll just see how Brie reacts if I call her a dog, you know, and uh, I'm just kidding. I, I don't have the guts to, to do that. <laughs> I'm not man enough. Um, and you shouldn't be either, uh, just for the record. Calling someone a dog, okay, is not a compliment. There's no way to mix this around, translate it different, culturally appropriate it to make it a compliment. It's not a compliment. You're missing the point of the story if you try to make this softer and easier. This statement is a little harsh, but it is on purpose, and that's why I'm saying bear with me. Hear what she responds with. Verse 27, yes, Lord. I, I want you to notice that. There's not like a, how dare you? Right? There's not like a, what are you, what are you doing? Yes, Lord. She, yeah. You're right. The Canaanites, we are the dogs. Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Jesus replied to her, woman, your faith is great. He actually says, your faith is astounding. Your faith is astounding. Let it be done for you as you want. And from that moment, her daughter was healed. Let me ask you a question. Is this the Jesus you're familiar with in Scripture? This story? Does it represent what you're used to expect when it comes to Jesus healing, delivering, rescuing, working with people? Is this what you normally see? No, right? In fact, we've seen the exact opposite the whole time. Even in the Kingdom series, remember? He comes back from hearing about his his friend, his, his family member, John, being beheaded, and he goes out and does what? He heals all day. He heals all day and all night to the point where people need to eat, and then he does what? The feeding of the 5,000. You remember that? He heals everybody, 10,000 people coming to him with 
every single ill. And you might say, well, maybe they were all Jewish. But we know that's not true. Remember the centurion who came to Jesus and said, hey, my son's at home sick. If you just say the word, he'll be healed. And Jesus says, you have the greatest faith in all of Israel. And he heals his son. We are used to, in every situation, seeing Jesus heal indiscriminately, immediately, and to every single person who asks. So why all of a sudden is this different? You should think and stop. Why is Jesus doubling, tripling down in the way he's responding to this Canaanite woman? Let me ask you a question. How do you get 12 Jewish men who, who have spent their life in church and recognize the ills of Israel's past and the Canaanite people to accept a Canaanite woman as part of the kingdom of God? How do you do it? How do you do it? Is there anything you, yes, thank you, yes. Prove her faith. How? Make yourself the bad guy. What is Jesus doing in the story? He's making himself the bad guy. He's making her the hero, the sympathetic character in the story. I'm not saying he's doing something wrong. He's doing a reversal on purpose. Notice the disciples. Their immediate response, this lady's following them, crying. This had to be unbelievable to them. Like, <laughs> all of a sudden, Jesus just woke up on the wrong side of the bed or something. He's not saying anything. This woman's just weeping, begging for healing for her daughter. He's not even acknowledging she exists. And they're there. What is wrong? They feel bad for a Canaanite woman right off the bat, right? The doubling and the tripling down. All of a sudden, she reveals that her faith is astounding. She believed so much in Jesus that there was nothing that even he could say that was going to stop her from believing that he would heal. That's how amazing this woman's faith is. Now remember where we've been. We just saw the Pharisees, right? And not just any Pharisees. The Pharisees from Jerusalem, the center of all Jewish church activity, they came down to have a battle with Jesus to find anything they possibly could to accuse him of, to find anything they possibly could to deny that he was the Messiah. And what did they end up with? You don't wash your hands, right? That's all they got. You don't follow all tra our traditions. The Jewish people, the promised people of God, sons and daughters of the kingdom, the chosen people of God in the Old Testament, God's own, fight tooth and nail and claw these religious leaders to deny their Messiah in this situation. This woman who has no right to know anything about God, to know anything about the Messiah, to know anything about what God is doing in Jesus, not only calls him the son of David, but pursues him over and over and over and over again, persists and persists and persists until she's healed. Do you see the contrast between our two characters in the story? Why is Jesus so harsh? He wants to show this woman's faith. Have you ever known somebody that said they were a Christian but were a little rough around the edges? They were a little rough around the edges, and they didn't really fit what you thought in your mind, hey, that's a Christian person. You, basically, you get in that position, you're like, buddy, you don't make the cut, all right? right? I, I just know because of the way you look and the way you act and the things you say, you're not in. And all of a sudden, something happens in that person's life that shakes them to their core. And you're there to witness that they hold on to Jesus. I don't know if you've had this situation in your life before. I have. It's this moment where you realize I'm the problem here. I've put you in this category, this box, and I said, you can't be part of the kingdom. And all of a sudden, you prove that your faith is greater than I even imagined. That's what's happening here. Jesus is making his 12 disciples realize that this woman had amazing faith. All right, why might that be? Let's get into it for a little bit. Here's my lesson for disciples. It's my only one today. It's simply this. The kingdom of God cannot be contained. The kingdom of God cannot be contained. But let me tell you a harsh truth. We try. We try. We try to contain it all the time. We do. You are not immune to the issue that the disciples have here. Where, where they go and they think, and I'm not even saying that they have bad reasons to think this way, right? That, Holy Scripture, Old Testament, they're God, they know. 
but they've come to the wrong conclusion based on the information. And why? There's a lot of reasons. One of those has to be cultural, tribal, involved in the way that they grew up. But they, in their minds, think this woman is unsavable. Jesus shows the opposite. Let me tell you something. When you get to heaven, you're going to be surprised at the people who are there. Let me tell you something else. When you get to heaven, you're going to be surprised at the people who aren't there. Okay, the Pharisees, of all people on the planet, should be the ones in the kingdom. By all accounts, this Canaanite woman, by all accounts, should be the one outside. But what's happened? Right? So let's ask this big question. What's with the dog thing? (laughs) It's actually a lot more important than you realize. Do you remember what we read to begin our service? What was it? Psalm 22. What was in Psalm 22? Let's go there. Go back to Psalm 22. Come back with me. Right back to where we started. Full circle here. Psalm 22, Jesus, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's what he says on the cross. We see all this stuff happening with with piercing the hands and the feet. It's all playing out. And what does Jesus pray? And what does David in the psalm, but then Jesus later pray? Verse 16, for who? Dogs have surrounded me. A gang of evildoers has closed in on me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. People look and stare at me. They divided my garments among them and they cast lots for my clothes. But you, Lord, don't be far away from me. My strength come quickly to help me. Rescue my life from the sword, my only life from what? The power of these dogs. Come with me to Jesus' crucifixion in Matthew. We're going to Matthew chapter 27. Notice Down at verse 46 is where he quotes this psalm. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Before that, we see this in verse 41. In the same way, the chief priests, the scribes, and elders mocked him and said, he saved others, but he cannot save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we'll believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now. Do you hear the arrogance? If he takes pleasure in him. Who are the dogs? Who are the dogs in the psalm? Scribes? Elders? Chief priests? Who are the dogs? The ones who the kingdom was supposed to belong to. The sons of God. God, the chosen people, the the head religious leaders in the psalm and in Jesus' crucifixion, they're the dogs he's praying about. Save me from the dogs. One more passage. At the end of your Bible, Revelation chapter 22, one of the very last things Jesus says in all of Scripture. Check this out. Verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gate. What does verse 15 say? Outside are the what? The dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. So what's happening in our story? Remember what the woman responds when Jesus says it's not good to give the bread of the children to the dogs. Yes, Lord. Right? Yeah. I'm the dog. You're right. Folks, when you read this list, your mind shouldn't go to other people. Okay? The sexually immoral, are you there? You better say yes or you're lying to yourself. I know with 100% certainty you are the sexually immoral. Without a question. You have had lustful thoughts. You've had wrong thoughts. You've done things outside of God's intention for you sexually. No question. All of you are in it. I'm in it. Congrats. You're the dogs. Right? Murderers, we might say no. What does Jesus say? You anger with your brother and sister. You hate your brother and sister. You've murdered them in your heart. Okay? Who are you? You're the dogs. Right? 
The idolaters, you don't think you've worshipped idols in your life? You may not have a little statue you bow down to at home. I guarantee you, you've put other things before God. I know that with certainty. There's not a question in my mind. So have I. So have I. You are the dogs. Congrats. And so am I. This woman says, yes, Lord, I'm the dog. You're the Savior. So help me. You see? What do the religious leaders say? Go ahead and get up off that cross, O son of God. If God loves you so much, why isn't he saving you? Right? Do they realize they're the dogs? But who are they? In the psalm, they are the dogs. The key to this story is realizing that Jesus is speaking truth to you and to me and telling you, you must recognize that you are a sinner in need of grace. You need a savior. You do. The religious leaders missed it. I don't want you to miss it. You see, because there were 12 disciples there who this lesson was for. To recognize that God can save a Canaanite woman would have been a profound, amazing, wonderful, world-shaking truth. But guess who was there among the 12? Judas, right? One of the 12, the inner circle of Jesus, one of the disciples, one of the chosen, one of the ones who's supposed to rule in the heavenly kingdom over the 12 tribes of Israel. He's a dog. But he didn't realize it. He missed the message right in front of his face. I don't want you to miss it. I don't want you to miss the reality that you need a savior and that Jesus can save. C.S. Lewis has this amazing quote in Mere Christianity that I want to read. You see, because part of our problem is when we don't recognize that, we start to, to look at others and say, well, they're the dogs. I'm the one who's, who's good. I'm the one who's righteous. And, and we break one of the commandments of God, and that is to love your neighbor as yourself. And why do I say that? Well, this C.S. Lewis quote will help us understand it a little bit better. Let's see if it, there it goes. It's from Mere Christianity. He says, I remember Christian teachers telling me long ago, that I must hate a bad man's actions, but not hate the bad man. Or as they would say, hate the sin, but not the sinner. I used to think this is a silly straw-splitting distinction. How could you hate a man or what a man did and not hate the man, right? How do you look at a man who murders and not hate the man? It's a, it's a valid question. But years later, it occurred to me that there was one man to whom I'd been doing this all my life, namely myself. However much I might dislike my own cowardice or conceit or greed, I went on loving myself. Keep going. There had never been the slightest difficulty about it. In fact, the very reason why I hated the things was that I loved the man. Just because I loved myself, I was sorry to find that I was the sort of man who did these things. That's it. For most of us, you have no problem loving yourself. Here's what I mean. When you do things wrong, that wasn't me. That's not the real me. That's not who I am. I made a mistake, but that's, that's not who I am, right? You, you take your wrongs, you remove them from yourself, right? So Jesus should forgive it because that's, that's not who I am. I'm a good person. Wrongs out here. Me, I love me, so wrongs got to go over here. Doesn't matter what you do, we do this. The problem with that is you n almost never treat others that way. When your spouse does something that hurts you or upsets you, do you remove that wrong from them most of the time? Just be honest with yourself for a second. Say, that wasn't them, that was just the wrong. And I, and I love them, so I'm just going to remove that wrong, I'm going to put it out here. Or do you say, you did this to me, you're wrong, you hurt me, there's a problem. Come on, right? Do you treat your kids this way? Do you treat your neighbors this way? Do you treat your coworkers this way? Do you treat other people this way? You don't. You don't look at other people and go, oh, I can remove the wrong from the person. You look at the person, you say, you did the wrong, therefore you're wrong. Because you love yourself, but you don't love them. You're not willing to give them the same grace you give yourself. The challenge of this passage is to acknowledge that you and your sin are one. But there's a Savior who loves you enough to die for that sin so that he could have that relationship with you. 
And now our call is to go out and acknowledge that love, that grace, that compassion, that mercy to the people in our lives. And what that requires is that we look at them and we say, that's someone Jesus died for. Yes, they've committed wrong. Yes, they are a dog, but that's me too. Jesus can save them. Jesus can save them. That's what we're called to. But I would be remiss to acknowledge another layer of this. Jesus, in this example, the woman comes, she's, she's begging him to heal, and he ignores her, right? Then she continues, the disciples say, get rid of this woman. She continues, he responds, doubles down, right? She continues, he responds, triples down. Third one, the harshest of all of the examples of the dog analogy, right? She still continues. I'm going to say this, and I want you to listen. When's the last time you came to God and you begged him for healing and he said no? When's the last time you came to God and said, deliver me, and he said no, and it sounded like a silent shoulder turn? When's the second time afterwards you came to God after the first one and he was silent, and the second time the response was the same, maybe even a little worse? When's that happened once, twice, and then the third time you come and then the response seems harsh? right? I know you've experienced this. I know you have. I know you have. Guess what Jesus did too? Where's that psalm from? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? Why does it feel like you're far from me? Why does it feel like all these dogs are around me? Why does it feel like I'm suffering and I'm alone and my heart is like wax in my chest and I'm on this cross and they're, they're insulting me and they're cursing at me and they're... And, and, and they, where are you? Right? But what was the end of the passage? Lord, Holy One of Israel, I trust you. Into your hands I entrust my spirit. Right? That's what proves your faith. What proves your faith is the once, twice, three times. I still trust Jesus. I still trust Jesus. And to remember that he went through that same thing on the cross. I want to get one more passage and then we'll close. Because I think this quote from C.S. Lewis is awesome and I don't, want to, I don't want to undermine that, but I know that some of you in this room actually find it pretty hard to love yourself. Okay, you do. And I want to challenge you with something. Actually, let me get you John 5 here for a second. That's got to come up first. because I think it's really, really important. Now, Jesus is saying this to the disciples and to the others in the Christ. He says, the Father, in fact, judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Why is that important? What's Jesus saying? Even God the Father himself has handed off judgment of the world to Jesus. Where, to such a degree that God says, I'm out here. Father said, I'm taking the back seat. I've entrusted this to you, Jesus. You get to make the judgment calls. <laughs> this applies both sides. Whether you're judging someone else or you're judging yourself, who are you? Right? If God the Father takes a back seat and says, Jesus is the only one that has the right to judge, who are you? <laughs> right? Just want to point that out. Don't put yourself in Jesus' seat. You don't belong there. But let me get you this too. This isn't just about others, it's about us. Second Corinthians, or sorry, First Corinthians. It's going to come up there. There it is, chapter 4. Paul's talking about himself. He says, A person should think of us, the disciples, in this way, as servants of Christ and managers of the mysteries of God. In this regard, it is required that managers be found faithful. That would be pretty important, I would say. It is of little importance to me, though, that I should be judged by you, talking to his church, or by any human court. In fact, I don't even judge myself. Why? For I am not conscious of anything against myself, but I'm not justified by that. It is what? The Lord who judges me. What's he saying to his church? And what is he saying to us? I'm going to let you in on a little secret. You don't have the right to judge yourself either. What do I mean by that? I'm not saying that you don't acknowledge the realities of sin in your life. What I am saying is you don't get to say, I'm lost and I can't be saved. Because when you do that, you put yourself in Jesus' place. Just being honest. Until the end, when Jesus says the words, nobody, not you, not me, nobody gets to say, this person's out of the kingdom. Now Jesus gets to say it. And there's a real warning to us 
we love our sin, if we love our kingdom, if we love the evil in the world and we don't turn from that, there's a real warning to us that there will be a moment when Jesus will say, you're outside the kingdom, right? What do we read? The sexually immoral, the sorcerers, the adultery, right? That's the end of the book of the whole Bible. Jesus says that's coming. Don't miss that warning. But until then, you have no right to tell anybody else they're out of the kingdom and neither do I. And you don't have the right to tell yourself that you're out of the kingdom. I want that to encourage you today. You are a broken mess. And until you're able to acknowledge that, you're never going to find salvation in Jesus. But you won't be able to acknowledge that until you realize that you don't get to be the judge of yourself and you're so harsh on your own sin that you get to the point where you deny Jesus' ability to save you on the cross. And that's just as bad. You can be saved. Take heart, take faith. Jesus is great enough. The kingdom's large enough to welcome even a dog like you. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, God, help us today. Help us to do something that on our own power we just will never do. And that's just admit that we are wrong. That you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You get the final say. God, give us faith big enough, wonderful enough. Give us faith that's unbelievably strong. That even when we, like Jesus on the cross, experience what we feel is rejection or a cold shoulder from God, that we would be able to say, Lord, into your hands, I entrust my spirit. Give us also a faith big enough, God, that we never, under any circumstances, come to the conclusion that someone is lost until you say so. Give us a heart that loves them, that prays for them, that shares the gospel with them, that that walks with them. Lord, you have to do it. So by your spirit, I ask that you do it. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.